Not to be with us at Twickenham today. If you're a guest, we are so happy you're here. I know that uh, some of us are, are traveling, and we'll uh, pray for traveling mercies for you that you'll arrive safely. I know that uh, some of you are in town visiting with relatives for the holidays, or you have relatives visiting with you for the holidays, and so we'll pray for patience for you, okay? And we've all just been downstairs and uh, eating donuts, and we'll have a sugar crash about the time the sermon starts. So it'll be, be a great day. Hey, if you're in town and visiting, we're glad you're here. If you are from town and looking for a church home, we are really honored that you've uh, chosen to join us today. Thank you for coming. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes. Indicate any prayer requests there. That would be great. And we'll be praying about those as early as this afternoon. Just thanks for coming out on a messy Sunday morning. But you're in here now, and things are warm and bright, and we are blessed to be together. Last week, we began our service uh, by praying for one of our new babies. We, uh, one of our traditions here at Twickenham is that when there is a new birth, we begin our service uh, with a prayer for that little one. And today, we're going to begin with a different kind of new birth. A, a couple of our young people have decided that they want to give their lives to Christ in baptism. These are two great kids. Uh, they are the son and daughter of James and Heather Taylor. It's Joshua and Sydney, and they, I love these two kids. They're great. Walton Harless is one of our shepherds, and he's going to do the honors here. Yeah, this is, this is Joshua Taylor. Uh, many, most of y'all have watched Joshua grow up in this church. Uh, many of you have had him in class, been at summer camp or other youth activities, we've gotten to know him. Josh has been taught and uh, most particularly at home uh, with example, with, with teaching, with, the, with discussions. He has been ready for this for a while and uh, he's, he's gonna be 12 next month, I believe. But uh, this has been, because Josh, was, he's a very smart kid. Uh, he's good in school, he plays a lot of sports, plays in the band now. Um, he has a lot of gifts talents from God, but he knows that he can't do it all by himself. There are limitations that God, that Jesus has to resolve. So he can't, uh, he can't earn his own salvation. He can't uh, reconcile himself to God. He can't be righteous before God, but he knows and trusts in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you a question, Joshua. And uh, I know God and all of these witnesses and even the angels in heaven want to hear your response. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for the remission of sins? Yes. You will be blessed today and forever for that confession. And upon that confession, I can now baptize you in the name of our Father God, of Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins and for the gift of the Holy Spirit.
This is this is Sydney. This is Sydney Taylor. She has been talking about this a long time. Sydney has she has just a tender tender heart. Um, whether you know it or not, she she prays. She prays for you. She prays for people by name, and she lifts up prayer requests. She has a tender heart, but she knows that she needs Jesus as her Lord, as her Redeemer, as her Savior. And so she has been looking forward to this day for a long time. And uh, so now, Sydney, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want God and I want all these witnesses and even the angels of heaven to hear your response. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came and died for your sins, for the for, uh, for remission of your sins and for the for, to enable you to be one of his children? Yes. Well, based on that confession, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want to pray for these two real quick. Father in heaven, thank you so much for these precious hearts that have claimed your promises. And thank you for their, their, uh, their testimony, for their faith. And Father, just bless them from this day forward as your new children and my brother and my sister in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's take a moment. Let's stand and greet somebody around you with a hug and a handshake. And just remain standing for the next song.
a special night in Bethlehem years and years ago. Only a few people realized a king had arrived. There was no great welcoming party that gathered in Bethlehem, anticipating the birth of the newborn Messiah. There was no fanfare or royal announcement echoing through the streets of the city. There was only a quiet welcome by two parents that realized they had witnessed the glorious birth of a very special baby. The baby, the angel said, would be called Jesus. The one who'd be the savior of the world. Let's take our offering. What hope we hold this silent night A king is born in Bethlehem Our journey long outside of Bethlehem, a group of shepherds were startled when the sky erupted with excitement. An angel stood before them, broadcasting the joyous news. Good tidings of great joy to everyone. A Savior, Christ the Lord, has been born in the city of David. Then suddenly, a host of angels appeared to them, giving praise and glory to God. The shepherds wanted to adore the Holy Child, who held within him humanity's only hope of heaven. They came to the manger humbly, offering up all that they were in worship to this newborn king. They looked at him with eyes of faith. Eyes that saw both his humanity and his divinity. Both a child and a king. Tears are falling, hearts are breaking. How we need to hear from God. You've been crying. Thank you. 
Then there was Mary. As Mary gazed at her new child, she knew this was not an ordinary baby. She was, she was reminded of the words the angel had spoken to her. You will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. His kingdom will never end. Her heart filled with excitement as she anticipated the reign of this new baby king. She had no idea about the future. Where life would take this special child. She had no idea the redemptive purpose her son would pay for the lives of humanity. She only saw this moment. And treasured in her heart all that would happen that night. Breath of heaven, hold me together, be forever near me. Breath of heaven, breath of heaven, light in my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you as did those at the first Christmas, at the power and comfort held in these most cherished words. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. God has made his peace. His acceptance. Available to us through his son. It's that simple. It's that amazing. But those words were not only meant for Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. They are still relevant to us today. God still offers this good news to everyone. If you listen with your heart, you'll hear it again. Oh, come, oh.
Jesus came to earth and why he left heaven's throne to live in poverty and die in pain. He answered that question himself when he said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus began his life in a very humble place, but he lived a life that changed the whole world. He's still looking for a humble place to get started. He waits to be born again and again into every life that will welcome him. Into every heart that is humble enough to say, come in. Silent night. Oh. Christmas Day of 1944, Arbrea Faye Smith of Lubbock, Texas, answered a knock on her door. A uniformed officer asked for permission to come in. She feared the worst, but she was informed that her husband, Delvin F. Smith, was a prisoner of war. D.F. Smith survived that prison camp and would return home. The 9th U.S. Armored Division, followed by the 1st Infantry, broke through crumbling German resistance at Limburg, Germany, and freed the prisoners at Stalag 12. D.F. Smith was one of those prisoners. He later was an elder at the church where my father preached in Lubbock, Texas, and where I attended when I was in college. D.F. told my dad that on Christmas Eve of 1944, in Stalag 12, he was one of the American soldiers who sat in the dark lonely silence, each one thinking about home, about their wives, children, and families. He said that the night before, the Royal Air Force had missed their target, which was the railroad tracks nearby, and instead they hit the prisoner of war camp. There was a direct hit on the American officer's barracks that killed nearly every man living there. The next day, they were assigned to the task of digging graves to bury their friends. The windows of most of the barracks had been broken and fallen out. They tried to keep some of the cold air out by placing cardboard over them. There was no heat. They lay on the brick floor on top of a thin layer of straw. Each man had one ragged blanket for cover. He said that at last, a lull came in the bombing. He was once again alone with his thoughts that turned to home and Christmas's past when there was no war. Many of the men wept openly as they spoke of those memories. D.F. Smith tried to remember every Christmas present he had ever received. He tried to remember every home that he had spent Christmas in. He tried to picture in his mind the faces of his mother and father and especially the face of his dear young wife. He also tried to still his fears that he would never see those precious beloved faces again. The dark silence of that night was broken as one of the prisoners began singing Silent Night. Mm -hmm. One by one, the familiar tune was picked up by the others until all had joined in. Every American soldier was singing those beloved words of faith. As tears streamed down their faces. To their surprise, the German guards began to sing in their native tongue, the grand old carol. As the last note faded, there was a deep silence, and peace on earth reigned in Stalag 12. Even though he was not a Christian at the time in that prisoner of war camp so far from home, D.F. Smith felt an inward calm. Because the Christ child had come into the world. 
when he came home, that incident never left D.F. Smith. It changed his life forever because he was determined to know more about this child who became a man. As we have celebrated this child, so also do we celebrate the man who would give his life for each of us. And we remember that each and every week when we take this bread and this cup. And I hope that you will especially be mindful of it this morning and in this time of year. Let's pray together. God, we are forever grateful through the ages for the promise of a son and the giving of a son. A son who would give in return so much more than we could ever give. Who would give his life. Who would give his body and allow it to be broken on a cross on our behalf. And so we remember the baby and we remember the man as we share this bread together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as we consider the cup, we consider that our Savior was born to bleed, that a crown of thorns would pierce his brow, nails would pierce his arms and his feet, and a spear his side.
to take away the transgressions of the entire world. As we drink, may we marvel, may we wonder in awe at the greatness of this gift and our great need for it. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
And one of the things I look forward to every week is coming to worship because this church worships so well. And, and Lincoln and uh, Lily and Bell, thank you guys and team. What a great job leading us this morning through a meaningful time of service. Thank you guys so much. Hey, let me do a little quick program note here about next week. Um, we're going to gather again, and we're just going to go through the story of Jesus uh, from beginning to end, and we'll be using nothing but Scripture next week. That'll be our focus. It'll be a great time for you to come and be here, a uh, great time for you to bring a friend, and we'll celebrate that time together. And let me just be, are we doing, I don't think we do Sunday school next week, do we? It's just the 10 o'clock worship service. We had donuts and coffee this morning. But next week, it'll, we'll just come together for worship, and we'll go through the story in Scripture alone, Scripture and Psalm. So it'll be, it'll be a good day for you to be here. Speaking of which, let me give you a little sneak peek at something that's coming up in 2018 that I'm really excited about. Uh, this is something that Steve Krieger and our Education Council have been working on. They've done some good work on this. We're, we're, one of our core values uh, here at Twickenham is hunger for the word. And then another one is life and community. And it's Huntsville. So since it's the Rocket City, technology's got to be involved in there somewhere, right? So in 2018, we're going to bring those three, those three things together, scripture, community, and technology in something we call in the word in 18. Don't freak out about this, okay? We're going to try and read through the entire Bible together. I know, it just, that really like intimidates people sometimes because I've tried to do that a million times. It's been my New Year's resolution for like whatever, and I never get through it. Relax, we're going to do this together this year, and here, here's how it's going to happen. We're, we're going to make available to you a free app that goes on your device, your phone, or, or one of your devices, and it will gently lead you through that process. Then on Wednesday nights, we're going to come together as a community and talk about the stuff we read the week before. And since we're doing this all together using community and technology, I think we can get through it and really be blessed by it. We're going to call it In the Word in 18. Now, we don't have a logo for that. That's why you don't see anything up on, on the screen about that. So I thought it would be fun if we just invited you to create a logo for it, In the Word in 18. That's what we're calling it. Now, maybe you've been given that gift and you can create a logo for us. I, here's the thing. We may not use the logo you, you give us, okay, because it might really be bad. I don't know, all right? I've done logos for people before, and they looked at me and said, no. So it, I could feel your pain, but I think it would be neat if somebody could come up with something. In the word, in 18, send those in to, to steve at um, twickenham.org, steve at twickenham.org, and we'll take a look at those. That would be, be kind of a fun thing to do together. But I, just, I, wanna, I want you to be thinking about that and praying about it because Getting into the Word all through 2018 together as a community will be an awesome experience for us. It'll be, it'll be a good thing for us. We'll look back on it, have some great memories of it and when we get to 2019, and it'll be good for our church. Speaking of memories, I bet you have, and I really appreciate the memory that Lincoln shared this morning about the man that, that he knew and his father knew back in Lubbock. I bet you've got some Christmas memories uh, that you look back on and you go, you know, those are cool or maybe not so cool. I had one of those uh, in the, the last couple of weeks. When I was in the fourth grade at Buford Elementary School, it's a little town north of Atlanta, there was a little girl whose name I cannot now recall, uh, but I remember her face. It was framed with shoulder-length brown hair and the frames of her glasses um, curled up at the edges like butterfly wings. And I remember only one event in connection with this little girl, and it occurred around Christmas time. We were preparing to have our last day of school Christmas party in Mrs. Greer's class. And we'd exchanged names and, and bought gifts, and some moms had baked Christmas tree-shaped cookies, and somebody, probably Mrs. Greer, had, had uh, mixed up a batch of this sweet red punch. And the punch had been poured into to paper Dixie cups, and near the front of the room, uh, the, you know, the, the refreshments were waiting for us, and in the back around the Christmas tree, were the presents all wrapped and bowed and tagged with our names and ready to be torn open. And the end of the school Christmas party kind of marked the, the official beginning 
of the, the Christmas season and, and, and break. And everybody in class was really excited about it, anticipating the moment when Mrs. Greer would dispense with the lessons and commence with the festivities. Everybody except that little girl with the brown hair and the butterfly rimmed glasses. Just as the party was about to begin, a woman that I took to be her mother appeared at the door with a note from Mr. Avery, our principal. And she came to take the girl out of class. And she was an unusually serious looking woman to me, actually a little severe looking. And the little girl didn't look at all glad to see her. Uh, nevertheless, she packed up her things and left. She didn't eat any cookies. She didn't drink any punch. She didn't even take a gift with her to open later at home. And as she left, she had the strangest look on her face. It was a, a mingled emotions. There was some sadness and there was some embarrassment and maybe even a, a touch of anger. And I, it really bothered me. And so I asked Mrs. Greer why she had to leave. And Mrs. Greer said, well, her family doesn't celebrate Christmas. Their faith doesn't permit them to celebrate any of the holidays. They don't even celebrate their own birthdays. And there were gasps around the room. I mean, and then I, I guess Mrs. Greer kind of knew we were bothered by that. So she said, but it's okay. She understands. Who wants cookies? There was a kid named Anthony in class who wasn't bothered at all by it. In fact, he said, can I have her cookie? So but Anthony <laughs> was sort of, but it, it really bugged me. I mean, holidays are, are a big deal, but especially birthdays, if you're a kid, birthdays and Christmas, it would be easier to find a unicorn than it would be to find a kid that doesn't like birthdays and Christmas, and yet here was this little girl who'd been taken away. Um, I'll tell you what dredged up that memory. Uh, I was reading the gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus the last few weeks. Matthew and Luke go into great detail about the birth of Jesus, right? And each adds things the other leaves out, almost like they planned it. And you tell this part, and I'll tell that part. Matthew has the Magi. Luke has the shepherds. Matthew tells the harrowing story about the escape to Egypt. Luke tells the heartwarming story about Jesus in the temple, and old Simeon and Anna come up, and they're, you know, they do their thing. And, and then both of them talk about angels, John's gospel is a little bit different. He, he doesn't really tell the story, but he writes about it. You get the sense that John is writing about it in a very theological, prophetic, even poetic kind of way. John chapter 1, it, it goes like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. That sounds a little Christmassy. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh. That sounds like Christmas. And made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. Glory is a Christmas word. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's not quite as Christmassy as Hark the Herald Angels Sing, but it's very beautiful. It adds some the John adds some theological depth to the accounts of Matthew and Luke. And then there's Mark. The Gospel of Mark. Mark doesn't tell the story. Mark skips the shepherds and avoids the angels. He doesn't mention Mary or the manger. He ignores the unwilling innkeeper. He's silent about the star, not a whisper about the wise men. In Mark, there are no cookies and punch. There are no presents to open. There is no mysterious Christmas wonder. Mark reminds me for all the world, like that severe-looking woman who came and took the little brown-haired girl out of Mrs. Greer's fourth-grade class before she got to enjoy the cookies and punch. And it bothers me still. Why, does not, why doesn't Mark tell the story? Maybe he hadn't heard it, right? I mean, we always assume... That, that the people in the Bible knew everything about everything. But that's just not true. And all through the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark, 
The disciples keep missing the point, and when Jesus asks a question, they always seem to give the wrong answer. So just because Mark is in the Bible doesn't mean that Mark knew everything about everything, but we know that he knew about Mary because he mentions her in chapter 3. He mentions Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we know that Mark was acquainted with people who knew the story of Jesus' birth, so I can't imagine Mark didn't know it. But maybe Mark was kind of a first century Scrooge. You know, humorless, serious, insufferably sober-minded. Maybe he didn't like mystery. He just wanted to get down to business. But his gospel is full of mysterious stories. Uh, stories about demons and miracles. And, and as, as more than one commentator will suggest, if you take a look at them, Mark leaves his readers with more questions than answers. So you can't say that Mark doesn't like mystery. Mark is very mysterious and serious and sober-minded. Well, at the end of his gospel, he tells a story. And if you haven't read it, you won't even believe this is in there, but it is. At the end of his gospel, he tells a story about a young man who was with Jesus when Jesus was arrested by the Romans. And when the Romans grabbed the young man by the robe, he twisted out of it and ran naked out of the garden. That's in there. So you can't say Mark is Mr. Sober-minded all the time. And I'm pretty certain it wasn't a faith, faith issue with Mark like it was for the little girl in class so many years ago. Matthew and Luke certainly didn't have a problem with celebrating the coming of Christ by telling the story. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just listen to Mark, the first 11 verses. Let him tell us what he wants to tell us. This is Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist came, appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the more powerful, one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and to untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. That's how Mark begins. Interesting, isn't it, that he talks a lot about baptism just in those first 11 verses, we witnessed a couple of baptisms this morning. If that raises questions for you, we'd love to talk about it. One of, the, one of the most important things you can know about the Gospels is that none of them are simple biographies of Jesus. If they, if they were only written to tell us facts about the life of Jesus, one would have been enough. As it is, we have four Gospels. And even with four Gospels, we know precious little about the childhood and teenage years and early adult years of Jesus. So these are not, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not biographies. Each of them is written to a specific audience for a specific purpose. John's Gospel, for example, and he tells you this at the end of his Gospel around chapter 21, he says, I'm writing this so that you will believe. John's Gospel is written to create faith. Matthew is written in part to show us how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Over and over again in Matthew, he goes, this happened to fulfill this prophecy from way back here. Luke, one of Luke's purposes is to show how Jesus reached out to people who were marginalized, people who lived on the edges, people who were not always included, women, children, the sick, Gentiles. So what was Mark's purpose? And why did he leave out what is, for many of us, the best part? There's a very strong clue in verse 1. 
Mark's first word in the original language is the word beginning. And the second major word in his first sentence is the word gospel. Both of those words come loaded with a lot of freight. They're carrying a lot of freight. If they were a transfer truck, they'd have a hard time going up Montesano. Now, you can probably figure out why the word beginning is important. You remember these famous words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first verse in the Bible. So when Mark begins with the word beginning, he is saying something like this, in Jesus Christ, God did something so powerful, so revolutionary, so earth-shaping that it can be compared to when God created the world itself. That's how big this Jesus thing is. So what about the word gospel? Well, originally, the word gospel was not even a Christian word. It was used by Romans in the first century as a greeting, and it meant joyful tidings. So Mark chapter 1, verse 1 could be translated, the beginning of the joyful tidings about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which sounds a little more like Christmas, right? But I don't think Mark is trying to sound all jolly and bright. So what's he up to? Years ago, archaeologists discovered uh, an ancient inscription regarding a Roman emperor named Caesar Augustus. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because you've heard it recently in this Christmas season. Luke talks about it. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Caesar Augustus was on the Roman throne when Jesus was born. So here's what that ancient inscription that the archaeologists found said. Here's what was written on it. The birthday of the god Augustus was for the world the beginning of joyful tidings which have been proclaimed on his account. The birthday of the god Augustus was for the world the beginning of joyful tidings. Here's Mark 1.1 again. The beginning of the joyful tidings about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why does Mark begin this way? Why does he leave out the part about the precious baby born in the manger, welcomed by angels, visited by shepherds, celebrated by wise men? I think Mark begins this way because he's making a political statement. Mark begins this way because he means to confront the powers and authorities of the world, not with a weak and vulnerable baby, but with a powerful and conquering king. Herod had it right. Herod knew there was a threat to the throne. Mark knows that too. Look, sometimes you and I need the baby in the manger. We need to know that God approaches us in weakness and vulnerability because we are often weak and vulnerable. Knowing that God knows what it feels like to be powerless and dependent and helpless and frail helps us trust Him. It means that even if we are unwell and unstable and incomplete and broken, there is room for us in God's world. There is room for us in God because God understands that. But if an approachable God is all we have, We may well feel understood and affirmed and accepted, but we will never be healed, delivered, and set free. And so Mark gives us the grown-up Jesus, the Jesus that possesses power and authority, the Jesus that comes with some demands for obedience and worship and allegiance, the Jesus that comes with a specific goal And that is to be the sovereign in our lives, to completely rule over our lives. Preparing for this Jesus requires a bit more than decorating the house with lights and holly. 
Mark says that, that, that when John came to prepare the way for Jesus, remember we read that part a second ago, John came to prepare the way for Jesus, he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is how we get ready, turning away from the sins that we've embraced and receiving Jesus. And then, then as soon as Mark tells about, about John's message and Jesus' baptism, he immediately tells us that Jesus himself came preaching, and Jesus preached the same thing John did. The time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good, the, the, the good news, the glad tidings. To get ready for King Jesus, you and I have to get honest about our sin and we have to get busy doing something about it. Mark wants to introduce us to a Jesus who cannot be confined to only one month of the year. This Jesus is always coming with his power and authority, and his intent is to change our lives. You know, maybe Mark is trying to, to give us something to really celebrate. I mean, that would be something, wouldn't it? power and authority to change your life and isn't that what the christmas story is all about anyway something new and different has happened god has come to earth not not just to make us feel good but to make us be good to make being good possible not just to brighten one season of the year, but to illuminate our entire lives with truth. Not just to set us free from the boring routines of work and school, but to set us free from the chains of sin. Not just to give us wistful memories of the past, but to infuse us with exciting hope for the future. So maybe Mark doesn't skip the Christmas story at all. Maybe he just tells us a version of it we'd forgotten or never even knew. Maybe we're the ones that miss the meaning of Christmas. So Merry Christmas from Mark. And what do you do with that? Well, what do you do when you meet a king? You kneel. You acknowledge the authority, the power, and the importance of the one standing before you. And the really remarkable thing about this king is that he meets you and me with love and with mercy. Because his castle is a hill called Calvary, and his throne is a cross. And if you will meet him there, he will forgive and bless. And this is the best part. He will change you and me. Let's stand. Let's sing again together. Hail the heavenward prince of peace. Hail the Thank you. Thank, thank all of you for being here. We do hope you have a great week. Um, don't forget, Christmas, spring, and dessert, Wednesday night at 6.30, right here. And then, as Jody mentioned, no class next week, 10 o'clock service. And uh, congratulations to Jody and Lisa, who have a brand new grandbaby named Rowdy. Rowdy. Destined for problems there. <laughs> Rowdy. Got to live up to that. Hey, let me pray a blessing over your end as we go today. God, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for shining your face upon us, and may you continue to shine. Bless us with peace through this season. May we see mangers and shepherds and wise men. May we see Jesus in all that we do and say, in his name we pray, amen.
a poinsettia. If you paid for a poinsettia, you can pick that up today. So if you got a poinsettia, please get those today. Thanks.